Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, to Moritz for inviting me to be part of this program. Uh, I've really enjoyed my group, uh, Dan, Sven, and Alessandra. Um, I guess the first time I heard about the ISIM was from a fellow graduate student, but, the, but I actually have used the ISIM that, uh, the ISIM lecture notes that Moritz mentioned. So, um, in fact, we were working on this problem with nonlinear semigroups, and uh, we proved all these amazing things about this solution. Um, and it turned out we needed to know the solution existed. So um, there we went to the ISEM notes about these gradient systems. So um, anyway, it's great to be here. And uh, I'm going to let my group take it from here. Yeah? So um, yeah, we are group filers. And our talk will be about the T1 and the TB theorem. And uh, yeah, thank you for allowing us to talk here. Um, I want to apologize for all the semi-group people. This talk will not be about semi-groups, so. Um, <laughs> uh, right. There's a sense of humor. Yeah, yeah clearly. <laughs> um, so this will be a hybrid talk. So uh, most of the definitions and terms will be uh, on the slides. And uh, then we, but yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, Hopefully, the interesting proofs will be on the blackboards. Um, so we will talk a bit about uh, what is T1 and TB machinery. Uh, why does it? Where does it come from? Um, we will uh, do some proofs of uh, T1 and TB uh, theorems on the blackboards, and then we will end with an application about uh, so-called layer potentials. So, yeah, this talk is uh, so concerned with singular integral operators. Um, there are, of course, two types of uh, singular integral operators. There are the type of convolution type and uh, non-convolution type. And uh, yeah, I think it can be said that convolution type is, uh, is a bit easier. Um, in L2, we can uh, characterize uh, this with a uh, Fourier transform and with Plancherel. And then in LP spaces, we have uh, in practice, we, we also know enough because we have uh, multiplier theorems like we saw in the, I believe, the second talk today, uh, like the Michelin multiplier theorem. Um, so yeah, we know a lot about that. Um, we also know, for instance, that if we have a color on Siegmund operator, that if we have L2 bounds, uh, then we um, get for that um, also LP bounds. Right. Um, so this talk. Uh, yeah, as we already saw in the, in the last uh, lecture, um, we're interested in these uh, types of uh, estimates, the so-called quadratic estimates, which appeared in uh, the ISM lecture notes in uh, section 9.3 uh, for uh, certain averaging operators, um, yeah, more generally, a little bit Paley operators. Um, and uh, yeah, we will use some this, uh, this g-function notation, um, which I will write here, because it makes it easy uh, to write the estimate. So uh, yeah, if you uh, pay a bit of attention, then you see that this uh, quadratic estimate can be rewritten as the boundedness of this uh, g uh, theta function uh, in L2. Um, yeah, so uh, we started with this uh, very nice uh, document uh, that Simon sent us, uh, where uh, T1 and TB machinery is uh, yeah, proven in a very efficient way. And then afterwards, I asked myself, uh, why does this all work? Because if you follow all the all the proofs and all the inequalities, and you see that all the epsilons work, um, yeah, then you see that it clearly works, but why does it work? I think, um, yeah, we should put it in a bit of historical context. Um, yeah, so uh, a very important ingredient for all of this uh, is our uh, yeah, Carlson measures, uh, which we've seen, or we've talked about in the ISEM lectures. And, uh, yeah, this was a question whether uh, 
yeah, this measure dx over dt, uh, dt over t can be replaced by, uh, or by which uh, Borel measures it can be replaced by. And that naturally led us to these Carlson measures. And they were introduced in uh, 1962. Um, these Carlson measures uh, are used, or can be used to, uh, for example, um, characterize uh, Poisson operators in, uh, yeah, it's so a bounded operator from uh, Hardy spaces to LP spaces. Um, yeah, and it tells you that uh, this uh, operator P uh, is bounded linear operator if and only if uh, yeah, this measure mu is a Carlson measure. Um, right, so another important ingredient is this uh, Carlson's lemma. So if we have some uh, continuous uh, F on, the, yeah, on Rn plus one, uh, then uh, if mu is a, a Carlson measure, uh, then we can bound uh, this uh, thing on the, uh, this, uh, yeah, LP estimate uh, by the uh, non-tangential non maximal operator. And uh, we also have uh, Pfefferman Stein, which uh, tells us um, that this, uh, that this thing, uh, this object is a Carlson measure. Um, yeah, if we uh, have given a, a B that is in the B mode space and uh, a theta T that is a Littlewood Paley operator. All right. So um, yeah, these these are vital uh, ingredients for uh, development of T1 and TB machinery. So what is a T1 uh, theorem? Um, if you don't remember anything from this talk, then Perhaps uh, you should, or you should remember this. <laughs> so, uh, starting with a, a Littlewood Paley operator theta t. Um, so, if uh, this uh, d mu uh, is a Carlson measure, so we um, we, in some sense, uh, test uh, this uh, Littlewood Paley operator uh, with the uh, yeah, identity function, and then if this object is a Carlson measure, then we know that this, uh, yeah, this g theta function is bounded on L2. So it's quite uh, interesting when you see it for the first time because we only have to test for one, one function, but then we get that uh, this thing, uh, or uh, yeah, this estimate is bounded for, for every f in L2. Um, yeah, so we can reduce a uh, question of boundedness to a small set of testing functions. Um, but sometimes we want to be a little bit more flexible. Um, we don't want to plug in uh, an identity function, um, but we want to plug in some other function, and that is uh, referred to as uh, a TB theorem. Um, ah, right, so first direction I was due to uh, David and Junet in 1984. Um, and then we come to our TB theorem, which says that, yeah, which is essentially uh, the, the same type of statement. Uh, so we start with a Littlewood Paley operator, and um, we have given this test function in L infinity that is pseudo accretive. Um, right, so then if this thing is a Carlson measure, then we have uh, a square function bounds. Um, right. And then there's still some applications I want to show. <laughs> uh, right, there's this application of uh, yeah, Lipschitz, uh, uh, Lipschitz graphs, uh, or yeah, Lipschitz Cauchy integrals. So uh, if we have this uh, Lipschitz function and we have this graph, uh, then uh, yeah, we are interested in this uh, Cauchy integral. Um, and uh, yeah, with T1 machinery, we can show boundedness uh, yeah, when this uh, Lipschitz function is small. And it turns out that uh, with this TB machinery, you can, uh, yeah, you can lose this smallness condition and you can show uh, that this Cauchy integral is even bounded uh, yeah, for, for general Lipschitz graphs. Why is this interesting? Uh, this is interesting because if you know a little bit about H-infinity calculus, uh, then you know that this is, uh, yeah, uh, in some sense, uh, equivalent with the Cata square root problem in one dimension. 
Right. And yeah, so a final application we will see at the end of the talk, which is about layer potentials. Then I give the floor to Sven. All right. So my job is to establish some of the groundwork, um, which unfortunately is quite a lot. But uh, <laughs> I did uh, manage to uh, squeeze a little proof in there, although I might have to work some magic to make that work. Um, but uh, it is how it is. OK. So first of all, um, we want to establish what we mean with singular integral operators. Uh, and that starts at uh, our definition of a Calderon segment kernel. In that case, the kernel is defined on Rn times Rn. In this case, we have singular integrals, of course, so we're going to have to take one uh, part of the domain out of the uh, question. So we just take the diagonal uh, out of our discussion um, for the uh, definition, uh, every domain for the uh, kernel. And of course, uh, that's not enough. We need some uh, conditions. The first of them is uh, that we have like this sort of size condition that we can just look at the absolute value of a kernel and bound it. Uh, except that this uh, goes a bit wrong around the origin, or like around the diagonal. And uh, similarly, we also want some sort of continuity, just some alpha between 0 and 1, such that we can, in both arguments, uh, always can, can look at the difference between and, and add like this little h and uh, subtract the other part. And both of them we can, we can also bound again, in this case, depending on h, and uh, also only works if we have like some, some sort of uh, guaranteed distance between our points x and y, uh, depending on, on h. And if that is the case, uh, we simply write that k is an element of CZ. Okay, now what is a Calderon segment singular integral operator? Uh, in this case, uh, it is an operator that takes a test function and plugs, uh, gives us a, a distribution. And it is, uh, has like this property that if we take two test functions with uh, disjoint supports that we can just express what this operator does uh, by this product integral. And if that is the case, then we also write that T is an element of CZO. And also another thing we get if, if we want to evaluate uh, this operator at some point, as long as we stay away from the support of F so that we don't have any problems uh, plugging in uh, the same value for X and Y, we get this expression. And the classical result about these operators is that um, it's, uh, we want to assume that they uh, are bounded on L2, in particular are defined on all of L2 and also, also give us an L2 function, which is not guaranteed by the definition, right? But the good thing about that is, um, I mean, L2 is nice, right? Top five function spaces of all time. But <laughs> it's also just the only thing we need, because if we have this, then we also get this weak type bound for L1 functions and just a strict strong type LP inequality for every P between uh, one and infinity. And that's why all of those TB theorems we were looking at just strive to uh, obtain a bound for L2 because we don't need any more. OK. Now, um, a little reminder. We're going to need the uh, Hardy-Littlewood maximal function. We've seen this in the internet seminar and in like five other lectures. Um, this is the centered version, right? So we just look at the ball centered at the point we plug in. But that's also not that important. And we also need a different kind of maximal function, the so-called non-tangential maximal function, and that involves uh, convolution. So we take our function f, we convolute it with a function g, which we will uh, we have, we have like this, this dilation, gt, we take the supremum. Uh, in this case, also over like this, this kind of cone, where we look at points uh, that also are a bit away from, from a point x we plug in. And so we get like this, this type of maximal function, and um, as it is usually the case, uh, we will get some sort of result that we can uh, use the hardy littlewood maximal function to control many different processes, and one of those is this non-tangential non version. Um, so uh, the exact uh, yeah, lemma or exact uh, formulation would be that if we take some radial function that is integrable and also um, uh, radial de decreasing and non-negative, uh, in particular we also want that uh, phi of zero is less than infinity, um, and then if we, uh, we also, of course, need our f to have some form of integrability, otherwise this convolution is not even defined. And um, if we then can use, can find such a phi that can bound our function g or the absolute value of g, then we may control the uh, non-tangential maximal function pointwise 
by the uh, hardy littlewood maximal function. And uh, the constants that do that is some dimensional stuff and both the L1 norm of, of uh, phi and also this phi of zero, which is basically just the uh, L infinity norm. Okay, now we will need some, some more tools from, from Lidwood Paley theory. And one of those is the so called Calderon reproducing formula. Um, this is quite, yeah, quite abstract. We just need one function, theta, that is just uh, in, for, our, for our purposes uh, uh, supported in a ball of radius uh, one around the origin. Real valued, radial, it should, it should integrate to zero, but also not be trivial. And another assumption we need for a function is that the its Fourier transform is normalized, in such, or the function is normalized in a way such that we have this identity for the uh, uh, Fourier transform. And if we have all of those things, then we define an operator QT of f, which is just basically this, uh, this convolution and the dilation. And if that is the case, then this operator, if we, if we, uh, if, if we square it and, and integrate it, divide by t, then we get uh, just the identity function. This works on L2. And also this, this integral is, is uh, I'm cheating a bit here because that integral is not, you can't just uh, evaluate it uh, exactly. It's more of like a limiting process. You have to integrate from epsilon to one over epsilon and let epsilon go to zero. But this always works in, in, for L2 functions. So there's no problem. Uh, and another one, more of like a generalization of this, if we relax our conditions imposed on theta a bit, in this case, we still need it to be radial and integrable, and we need some. Uh, we need to impose a little condition on our uh, on its Fourier transform. And if this is the case, then first of all, this expression that in the other part we needed to be normalized, we get it's guaranteed that this exists then. And also, we have like this square function identity, which is sort of similar. In this case, it's 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 uh, we get like this term that is this that is normalized here. But uh, if we have like a more general uh, value here, then it just works all the same. Okay, I already mentioned the name Littlewood Paley theory. Now we actually get to something named after uh, that, and that would be <laughs> a family of functions, just like these uh, psi t indexed by t greater than zero. Um, also, sort of like a kernel structure in this case, so defined on R n times R n, complex valued, and we say that they uh, fulfill the Littlewood Paley conditions if we have, again, two very similar conditions to the one on, on the calderon sigmund kernel, a size condition and a continuity condition. There are some slight differences, of course, here. Uh, we have the, the t uh, standing above, and also we have t plus something so that we can actually also plug in the case of x equals y. Uh, and the continuity condition only uh, holds in the second argument. Okay, and if that is the case, then we also, similar to calderon sigmund write that psi t is an element of Lp. And now we get to uh, a yeah, more specific version of this, uh, of, of like this function g theta. In this case, our theta t, and that would be uh, we just integrate from uh, over the entire space uh, these functions psi t and multiply them by f and integrate with respect to y. That's also why this uh, smoothness condition is imposed on the second argument. The first one is mostly fixed in this case, and now uh, as like a first. Theorem, if we have this type of family, if like, if, so if our theta t has this structure, uh, no, no, this structure here on, on the slides, uh, <laughs> then uh, if we additionally assume that theta t of one is zero, then we get this square function bound, which is the same as saying that, that this function g, g theta is bounded on L2. And actually, this I will uh, prove. So, first we're going to start, uh, we're going to name this, this term, we're going to look at uh, just L. And I put a little reminder, uh, two things that I will use. Um, so, first of all, this L, I mean, looks too simple, right? We got we to gotta expand it a bit. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, it would be boring, right? So, we just use the uh, Calderon reproducing formula and, and plug it in uh, where F is. Right, so what we get is
Okay, lots of letters, lots of expressions. Uh, the first thing that's yeah, kind of annoying is that we have this data t outside of this last integral, and we would like to swoop it inside there. Problem with that is, um, well, I mean, we know that we can like take uh, linear operators if they are bounded. We can we can exchange them with the integral. In this case, in this case, we also have well, this 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 uh, this whole integral is kind of like a limiting process. So we're gonna need a bit of we're gonna have to check that this data t is is bounded in a very nice way, and. For that, we use the uh, the LP uh, Little Paley size condition in this case to just estimate what data does exactly. So what are we going to do? We're just going to use this this bound we get here, and we have t to the alpha, and then we have T plus x minus y to the n plus alpha, and then we multiply by f, y, and then dy. Right, so we took the absolute value inside the integral here, and then just used the little Paley size condition. And now we just want to take this t and t uh, take it outside of this integral. So to do that, we need to get a t to the minus n here, and then we just have a one here, a one here, and here we get x minus y divided by t to the n plus alpha, and then again times f. And now what do we have here? If you look at this expression, this is basically, this is just a convolution. One function is f, and the other function, well, this is one over one plus, but the point is, it's a radial function, right? We have the absolute value here. It's not negative, it's, discre it's decreasing, it's integrable because we have n plus some, some number greater than zero. So basically what we can now use is this comparison lemma that we can uh, control this non-tangential maximal function by the Hardy-Littlewood maximal function. So. In this case, the nice part is that we can bound the supremum over all of those t and simply get some potentially a yeah, different constant and then just make a function of f. Okay. Now, this is really nice because now what we wanted to show was that this operator theta t, or all of these operators, are bounded on L2. But we know that the hardy littlewood maximal function is bounded on L2. So uh, that is what we get. Also, since this bound is independent of t, we get that this, this theta t are a uh, uniformly bounded uh, sequence of operators. And then we will have no problem of taking this theta t and pulling it inside the, the integral. Which means we may now write all of those integrals at the start. And then just theta t qs squared. This is still squared, but then we have dx dt over t. Okay. Now, this is also a bit, bit simple, right? We need, we need some more. So another thing we're going to do is we're now just going to look at this, this guy that we're integrating right now. So we can just expand. And like for, for, for any, just take some gamma greater than 0, doesn't matter. And then we simply take at the qs squared of f and write it in this way. We take the minimum of this, these two guys, s over t, t over s, power of gamma over 2, and then multiply that 
by maximum of those guys again, and then we simply are left with what we were there, what we had before. Okay, so. I mean, of course, this holds, right? Because if one of, one of those is the minimum and the other one's the maximum, they just cancel out. This is greater than zero. Okay, but, but why are we doing this? Um, maybe you've seen this trick used before, um, but uh, it will all make sense in due time, I promise. Okay, so what we now want to do is use Hölder because that's, that's always a good idea. And in this case, we use Hölder, of course, in those, on those two products here that I neatly already put parentheses <coughs> around. And in that case, what we get from using Hölder is that we can now go ahead and write that L is less than So one of those things, those gamma over two become gammas because we now have L2 norm. Um, I also took the, uh, the liberty of, of uh, taking this absolute value inside the integral by triangle inequality. Um, so that's the first line we have left. Right? So this is our first uh, part of our product. No, still have to integrate. Well, that's okay. And then we get our second half, which is again integral from one over zero, uh, zero to infinity. Uh, and then we have the maximum these guys again just gamma. And here, of course, we also get beta t qs squared f. F squared, and then we still have to look at our variables. So we have ds over s, and then also dx, dt over t. Okay, right. So another thing is this integral here, this over this minimum, is actually quite unimportant. Oh, no, that's, that's nice. <laughs> so we can take this part, and we will just, I just start writing it like this. I will just take out this constant depending on gamma, and we are still left with all of our integrals. I mean, three is a good number, right? Uh, and then I claim that we only have this maximum left. Uh, and then the next line. We just have, again, our theta t times qs squared f of x, and then all of those ds over s, dx, dt over t. Okay, so why can we just ignore this, this minimum right here? Actually, it's, it's, it's quite simple. We can just look what this value is and then make sure that this does not depend on t. So, okay, yeah, okay. I see I have to improvise, okay. So, in this case, so what is this c gamma? Well, we can just take this integral, so it was integral over zero, right? zero to infinity of this minimum here, 
So let's just think about what happens when s is less than t. If s is less than t, then this minimum becomes s over t. This gamma s and the other part, if s is greater than t, then this is just flipped. Okay, so now for this term, if we look at, okay, it's, it's s to the gamma minus one, so we get a one over gamma if you integrate this, and uh, then you just have s to the gamma divided by t to the gamma, and you just insert t on the one term, so this just becomes one, one over gamma, and the other part is just zero, and for this integral it works the same way. So this does not depend on t, and in particular it is finite. Okay, so now I did mention that I will have to perform a bit of wizardry, and in this case, I have one thing that uh, I sadly cannot prove because of time constraints, um, but trust me, uh, this is not a bad thing. So what I now claim is this, we have some constant greater than zero, and we also have some beta greater than zero. And if we take any L2 function h, that we can take these operators we have here, in this case just theta t and one qs, not squared, we'll deal with the other one later. And what we get is that we can estimate this by this constant times, again, this minimum uh, beta. And another thing, we get the hardy little maximal operator squared evaluated on F, on H, okay. So, of course, this, this is something I would like to prove, I can't. The thing is, this is mostly elementary stuff, and what takes so long is that we have to actually take these, both of these cases, wherever the minimum is, and the proof works different ways. So, yeah, trust me, it's, it's, it's okay, but um, we, we do not have to do this here. Okay, so. Now I can, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> now I can finally get to, to the fun part, okay. So what does this give us then, All right? So we have this nice bound, and again, I delete with maximum operator, is, is bounded on, on L2, so it, it, it if you take it again, it's not, not gonna change much in that regard. So what we get is that we can take these, this operator, in this case, this theta t times qs, and we look at it as an operator on L2 to L2, this operator norm, and that simply means we can sort of bound this by a constant times this minimum <coughs> okay so that is pretty nice and um, the thing about this is that we're even going to give it a name because something like this is also referred to as a quasi orthogonality condition it has to do with those uh, STTS minimum stuff so um, now we did one calculation where we could just choose gamma to be anything, and now we have the existence of some magical beta. So of course, what are we gonna do? We're gonna set gamma equal to beta and continue on, okay. So if we say gamma is beta, what do we get? We combine all of this stuff. We get this constant. And I'm already eliminating this, this third integral here, because we have integral to the Rn, and that's the one over x. The x in this case, we have the absolute value here, so this is just gonna be, there's yeah, supposed to be a square here. Um, the L2 norm of this, so essentially I'm not changing anything, but removing one integral, and this maximum is, in this case, we plugged in beta, and then we have this, uh, theta t qs squared. Oh, 
f n of l2 squared, and then we just have ds over s, dt over t. Okay, okay, so we just found out that this operator, at least theta t times qs, we just kind of have to leave one in there, is bounded on l2, again by this, by this minimum. So in this case, we just get a slightly different constant. Integrate again, and then what we have, we still have a maximum left, beta, then we get this minimum again from an estimate, so that s over t, t over s, now this to the power of two times beta, I mean we started out with gamma over two, so we have two beta, and then just, we took out the theta t and one of the qs's, so what we have left is qsf, l2 norm, and then ds over s, dt over t. And now, well again, we can take one of those maximums and half of those minimums, just, just one beta, to get one, and then we're left with one of those minimums, but we already saw that the minimum we can take out of the equation because this constant does not depend on any of the of t or s. So we simply get that this is infinity and then we're left with this minimum. I'm going to write it down once more here. and then dt over t, and if we and just leave in the rest. And then we just change our constant, take away this minimum, and what we are then left with is simply f and l2. Now, why is that? What is that last step? Well, we had this, if we turn the slides back on, Okay, so we had this, this, this square function identity that I wrote down as a little reminder up there. And this is just the L2 norm of f. Here we have like the L2 norm of this thing. And if we combine all of that, we simply get, are simply left with that. And of course, in this, this is a different constant, so we're gonna make it less because this Mu of theta, in this case, we just estimate because we take any theta that fulfills the requirements of, this, of, of the Calderon reproducing formula, one of those exists, we just take any one and we are done. Okay, now, we still have a few things left. One of those is that in the end, we did a lot of stuff and what it came down to was this quasi quasi-orthogonality condition that we can also see up there. That means, in this case, we really only needed this identity to hold, and in that case, it doesn't really matter what our theta t looks like. Of course, we use the structure of it being a little bit Paley operator so that we ac could actually ex establish this result, but if we have this result for any family of operators theta t and another family of operators qs, what do they have to fulfill? Well, they have to fulfill the Calderon reproducing formula. I used that in the first step. And also this more general square function bound, which I used in the last step. And if those things are fulfilled, we don't necessarily need little bit Paley operators to do that. Okay. And another thing, just as a side note, um, to establish this causal orthogonality condition, instead of the regular LP size condition, if we're only concerned with the case of S less than or equal to T, we may replace it with this somewhat weaker integral condition um, as long as our theta s fulfills uh, some extra requirements that they integrate to zero and that they are supported in balls of, of radius s. Okay. Now, there's one thing left to look at and that is uh, because later on in the TB theorems, these functions, these B functions, 
will have to uh, come from a certain function space, and that would be the space BMO, also known as uh, bounded mean oscillation. And what does it mean for a function to be of bounded mean oscillation? Well, it has to be locally integrable, because what we're going to evaluate is we're going to take this mean value over any cube and look at what f does subtracted by this fq. And what is this fq? Well, it's the mean. So it's mean oscillation, so of course it's going to be the oscillation from the mean, right? Okay. So if that's the case, we simply write f is in BMO. Now there's some caution. We want this to have a, a, the structure of a functional space. In this case, however, if you look at this, this, this map here, this norm, or it looks like a norm, uh, it actually is not a norm because um, it is zero if and only our functions f, uh, f is constant almost everywhere. And to get, to get a normed space, what do we do? Well, we just, if two functions are, uh, differ only by constant almost everywhere, then they're the same. Kind of like we do with LP spaces, right? And um, if we do that, we have a Banach space. And this also has a couple of nice properties because actually the definition says we have to check uh, what it does with all of these mean values. And if we have some other constants and still get this bound for this supremum of all those cubes, then uh, we actually already know that our functions in BMO and we can control this, this star norm by, uh, by this upper bound. So essentially these, these, these mean values, they sort of minimize this expression. Okay. Also, bounded functions are in BMO which is pretty nice. You can just see that if you plug in a zero for all those constants, and then it's a simple evaluation to get that uh, the star norm is less than two times the supreme norm. And another thing, also known as the John Nierenberg lemma, is that a uh, function is in BMO if and only if we even have like this, uh, this different condition where we take average it in, in with the p, p norm, uh, p mean, and of course, if we have this for p larger than one, then this is stronger than for p equals one, but it's also sufficient. And it's also necessary um, because actually these two maps, if we have like a p here or not, they are equivalent. And that is a deep result by uh, John and Nierenberg. And one last thing, there's a relation between uh, the space beam and Carlson measures. In this case, um, pretty important one. Uh, if we have a BMO function and define an operator theta t like we did before, uh, and have this extra condition that theta t of one is zero, then we can look at this measure defined by theta t times v squared, and uh, then that is a Carlson measure. And also this, this, this constant that we get here, it depends on the BMO norm of b. Um, and one last thing that was mentioned already before in the introduction is the, the so-called Carlson embedding. Um, yeah. In this case, this uh, non-tangential maximal function is defined like the one we had with the convolution. In this case, it's just a function is defined on the upper half space. So uh, the t is going to be plugged in in the last component and the x in the first uh, n. And that's it for me. Okay. So um, um, as Dan mentioned before, um, uh, the strategy, the general strategy of T1 and TB theorems is to study the uh, altitude boundiness of these uh, singular integral operators or Calderon segment operators T. Um, and in order to analyze that, uh, we apply these operators T to particular functions such that the constant functions one or uh, these uh, B functions that we will mention and define later. So um, uh, first of all, I introduced this, we introduced this definition which will be used to show later an equivalence for the T1 theorem uh, for the singular integral operators. This is the definition of a weak boundiness property. So the operator T satisfies these WBP properties if there is this bound uh, for TF applied to G. And uh, a particular case uh, that uh, will be mentioned later is when k is a calderon sigmund kernel and is anti-symmetric, then uh, if we consider these tfx defined uh, as this limit for epsilon that goes to zero, then it exists in terms of distributions and satisfies the WBP property. And another property that will be used later is this estimate uh, of uh, calderon sigmund operators. 
So if T is a Calderon segment operator and T is a bounded operator in L2, then this estimate holds and it will be used in uh, uh, oh, the equivalence that I will um, prove uh, or I will mention later. But before that, uh, we are talking about T1 theorem, so uh, I would like to try to give a sketch of the proof at least of the T1 theorem for square functions. So we have a C psi T family of Littlewood Paley operators. Uh, oh, sorry, one, epsilon, one Y more. And uh, we have already mentioned this theta T F. And we suppose that theta T1 squared dx dt of a T is a Carlson measure. Then if it holds, we have that the g theta f l2 norm uh, defined before uh, is characterized by a square function estimate where the constancy depends on the r. Okay, they told me that l comes before p, but I always write p before l, so it should be a little bit paley, but it is paley little bit. I'm sorry. Um, and so this constant depends on the little bit paley um, uh, constants for psi t and the uh, Carson norm of the um, Carson measure me. And uh, uh, the idea of the proof is this one. Um, uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. okay. Oh, what? No, don't worry, thank you. Uh, you can sing or dance or chat in the meanwhile. Uh, I don't know, right? Okay, so, okay. Um, the idea of the proof is to consider that uh, theta T1 of X is not equal to zero because if it is equal to zero, we have already mentioned the L2 boundedness of G theta, that also if uh, theta T1 is equal to zero, and uh, we decompose theta T F as um, theta T minus theta T1 X PT applied to F. Okay, plus uh, theta t1 pt f, uh, we call this one rt, and pt applied to f is defined as it convolution with f, and uh, uh, phi t of x is t to the minus n phi x over t, uh, phi is a radial function such that the integral of phi is 1 and it is a c0 infinity function defined on the ball of center 0 and radius 1. Okay, so we have to show the estimate for these two terms and now we notice that rt applied to 1 is a zero, and that by the uh, conditions on the psi t family of Littlewood Paley functions, we have that this sub of theta t1 <laughs> is less or equal than a function that depends on the psi t constants. And, <laughs> thank you, um, uh, okay, um, so we have this one, this one, and finally, oh my god, okay, uh, it's the kernel of RT is a function that we can call psi tilde, which is, results to be psi t minus theta t1, phi t x minus y, and it holds that it actually is in Littlewood Paley family. <laughs> okay, 
Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and thus, we have that the, um, uh, the L2 boundedness uh, estimates uh, for D theta apply to RT also. So we have that the integral from zero to infinity integral over Rn, absolute value of Rt f squared dx dt over t is uh, can be estimated by the L2 norm of f squared. Okay, so uh, it, uh, it shows the boundedness for the first term. For the second one, okay, we have that integral from zero to infinity integral over Rn of this absolute value. Um, can be estimated with the um, uh, norm of the non-tangential maximal operator of PTF multiplied by the integral from zero to infinity integral over Rn modulus theta t1 squared dx dt over t. And by hypothesis, we have that this one is a finite quantity. And now we use the results that uh, Sven has mentioned before. So uh, this is after constant less than the uh, maximal uh, little root um, function squared. Can you write it in data? Oh, yeah. Uh, just ah, okay, okay. Um, for this quantity, but uh, it is less or equal than a constant for the L2 norm squared of f. And so we also have the estimate in terms of uh, L2 norm of f squared for the uh, second term. Now, okay. Um, uh, this is the equivalence that I've mentioned before for the uh, singular integral operators. We have that if t is a Calderon sigmoid operator, the following are equivalent. So t uh, satisfies the weak boundedness property, and the t1 and t0 join 1 are BMO, and uh, t is a bounding operator from L2 to L2, uh, which means that this estimate holds. And uh, just a few uh, observations. Uh, we notice that if k is anti-symmetric, then t adjoins minus t, so we just have to show that t1 is a BMO. And uh, in particular, uh, we notice that um, we just have to prove that a specific function, which is the constant function one, oh, sorry, um, um, is such, should be such that uh, t applied to one is a BMO function. And uh, just to give an idea of the proof of these other results, so my explanation is pretty boring and full of writing. Okay, we have um, that two implies one is much uh, weaker. Uh, and no, sorry, it's much shorter because there is the result that I've mentioned before, which says that if t is a Calderon sigmoid operator and is a bounding operator from L2 in L2, then we have that t is defined from L infinity to B and O and uh, such that uh, the norm of Tf in terms of BMO is less or equal than a constant L infinity norm of F multiplying the norm of T plus another constant that depends on the Calderon sigmund operator. So uh, using this one, uh, we have in particular that uh, T1 
is a VMO function. And in a similar way, we show that T adjoin of height one is a BMO function. And for the uh, weak boundiness property, uh, we just use that um, the L2 boundiness rules. So TF applied to G by hypothesis, uh, we have that these two functions are C zero infinity in a ball of center a point X zero and radius R. So it is less than a constant for L2 norm of F, L2 norm of G. And using uh, Cauchy's Schwarz inequality and the uh, hypothesis about the operator, we also have that this is less or equal than a constant R to the nth power L infinity norm of F, L infinity norm of G. Uh, a little bit longer is the implication one, two. Uh, in fact, it is based on the uh, operator QT that we have used before. And uh, we recall the Calderon reproducing formula. So the integral from zero to plus infinity QT squared over T dt is equal to the identity. And we define the operator PT applied to F as the integral from t to plus infinity of qs squared s ds applied to f. And uh, a result, a claim that I won't show, I'm sorry, is that uh, ptf can also be written as pt convoluted with f applied to f, x, uh, which is the same operator that I have mentioned before. And please consider that it holds. Um, I swear it holds. Um, okay. No? Okay. 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 Uh, we have in particular that uh, minus d dt of pt is equal to qt squared t and t, and so we have uh, to consider tf applied to g in order to prove the L2 boundiness, which can be written as the limit for epsilon that goes to zero of t p epsilon f p epsilon g, but it is Okay, it is the limit um, of the integral from epsilon to one over epsilon of minus d and dt of uh, t p t f p t g. Oh no, p t. Okay, and this is minus the limit from epsilon to one over epsilon. So let's apply all the derivatives. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, we know that PT is a self-adjoint because QT is a self-adjoint. So PD star is equal to PT. So we have the dt of PT um, T pt f scalar d plus uh, then we have t pt no uh, pt t d in dt pt f apply to g dt okay but now we know that this is equal to qt squared over t QT also is self-adjoint, thus we can rewrite them as minus um, QT T P T F Q T G D T over T. And this one in a similar way as minus this in this case we bring it there, applying the adjoint operator, and we have 
um, QTF apply to um, QT uh, T star PT G DT over T. Okay. Okay, now, uh, if we call them uh, um, one epsilon and two epsilon, okay, we notice that their structure is pretty similar, so we just have to show the boundiness for the first term. And now, okay, you don't see, so. Uh, or I can write here. Thank you. Okay, uh, for the boundiness of this term, we notice that this one is less or equal than the integral from zero to plus infinity of um, this one that we can call theta t. So we have uh, theta t f uh, multiplying uh, q t g d t over t, okay? And uh, if it is less or equal, then applying the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality integral over r n up to values of theta t f squared dx d t of t and the same integral for QTG okay and let's call this one B this one A okay but we already know from one of the results that's been mentioned before that it can be estimated with the L2 norm of G. So we just have to show that this one is less than a constant for the L2 norm of F. And uh, it follows from the fact that, um, uh, I won't show that because it is too much longer, maybe even more boring than my presentation is already. Um, so this one uh, is due to the fact that uh, it's a little bit paley kernel, is, is actually a little bit paley kernel because uh, it satisfies the, uh, two, uh, su the, the two estimates required for this family of functions. And uh, if we consider that uh, t theta one was defined as Q T T P T applied to one uh, as it is as it is defined P T it is equal to one so it is a Q T T one but by hypothesis this is a BMO function and so uh, applying um, applying Pfeffer Munstein lemma we have that. Uh, it's modulus squared dx dt over t is a custom measure. And so uh, the hypothesis holds and we can finally have the uh, conclusion uh, for the L, uh, L2 bodiness of uh, absolute value of tf applied to g. So, okay, it is finished. Uh, and um, the next step is to consider instead of the constant function b equal to one, an L infinity function, and uh, in order to uh, in order to do that, we have to introduce a definition which is called uh, the uh, accretive function. We have that b in L infinity is an accretive function if there exists a delta greater than zero such that the real part of b is greater or equal than delta, and the most important definition in the uh, TB theorem uh, for square functions and also for the local version of TB theorem is that B is a psi accredited function. If furthermore there is an approximate identity PT as one of the 
many operators that I've mentioned, is such that its absolute value is greater or equal than delta. And this is a variation uh, that actually I won't consider, but I've just written, so for general culture, I don't know, uh, which is the dyadic version. So if we have the average on the uh, dyadic cubes, and um, a remark is that a creative implies a psi credit because of that inequality in terms of the uh, PT operator and uh, uh, the um, and this property uh, with the uh, real part, these exchanging property, we could say. So we have the TB theorem for square functions, and the structure and also the proof is pretty similar to the T1 theorem for the square function. So it's uh, it's short, I promise, and uh, uh, it states that if we have a little bit Paley family of functions as before in Ted and T, and uh, uh, if furthermore there exists a psi credit B such that this is uh, this time we have Ted T applied to B squared dx dt of T is a causal measure, then the um, L2 estimates holds, and uh, in order to see that. Thank you. Uh, we have to uh, uh, follow the same strategy of the T1 theorem for square functions. So uh, we have that B of psi accredited um, is equivalent to uh, the inequality that is written there. And we can rewrite it as PT applied to B delta minus one greater or equal than theta t1 here and here. Uh, so uh, now we want to use the uh, t1 theorem for square functions. We want to prove that this term squared dx dt of a t is a causal measure. So uh, we, uh, we show that uh, it was for this term and as before, we decompose uh, pt bx uh, theta t1 as um, pt theta t1 pt minus theta b theta t applied to b plus theta t applied to b. And we know by hypothesis that its absolute value squared dx dt of t is a causal measure. Now we call again this one RT. And as before, we have that RT applied to one is equal to zero. Then its kernel um, satisfies the um, Littlewood Paley estimates. So uh, is actually in a Paley Littlewood family. So we have the psi tilde t okay and so as before uh, we can apply the um, uh, l2 bondiness for the disappear g theta um, and um, we can conclude that also rt 1x squared dx dt over t uh, is a constant measure. Okay, and thus more or less we have the conclusion also of this result. And uh, so uh, uh, to conclude my part, um, finally uh, we have the local TB theory. Uh, sometimes um, it is more convenient to um, apply the uh, T operator in order to study its L2 bondiness to a family of functions which are defined not globally, but locally, where locally means on these uh, dyadic cubes. And there are versions uh, both for the square function estimated and the uh, singular integral operators of the theorems that we have seen before for the local TV theory. And they are based on uh, a John Nirenberg inequality for custom measure. 
and uh, it is uh, a little bit maybe technical and even more boring than all these proofs. So uh, I haven't mentioned it, but uh, we have just put this funny image which tries to explain the uh, strategy of, uh, um, of definition of this dyadic so tooth region. And uh, uh, this John Nirenberg inequality let us <laughs> Uh, built the uh, specific family of dyadic cubes we need uh, to define the family of a BQ functions we want to use to test the operator T. <coughs> and thanks to that, we have the uh, local TB theorem, so the local version of the TB theorem, uh, which states, as we can see, that if we have theta T and psi T family as before, um, and for every Q dyadic cube, there exists a family of functions PQ in L2 such that this estimates alls and such that uh, the uh, absolute value of theta t bq squared dx dt over t is a constant measure. Then we have the square function estimate for the uh, operator g theta that was written here. Um, and so that's my part. Okay, so for the final bit of our talk, I will entertain you with uh, another application of T1 and TV machinery. And uh, <coughs> yeah, that is about the uh, methods of uh, layer potentials. Um, maybe let me start by stating something you all know, is that uh, if you have uh, uh, some elliptic problem uh, on a, in some domain, um, yeah, then um, if you have, uh, uh, yeah, if your U is in uh, uh, some uh, space W2P, uh, then we know that, uh, that, this, uh, that this trace, uh, uh, on, on the domain, uh, has to, uh, from trace theory has to live in uh, a space like this. Uh, and uh, yeah, this section is roughly about uh, replacing uh, this, uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, this function g uh, by, uh, and we also have estimates for these things, of course, for a solution u, uh, by replacing that uh, with uh, traces uh, with uh, less regularity uh, with traces in uh, L2. Okay. Um, right, so uh, for that, we will talk about methods of layer potentials. Uh, so we can, for example, consider uh, some divergence-free operator, um, or uh, yeah, more generally, uh, we can also uh, consider an operator with uh, lower order terms uh, and also with potentials, uh, which may be interesting. For example, if you are interested in, um, in the uh, Schrodinger equation. Um, right, so we consider this in uh, Rn plus one, uh, where there is uh, like a, uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Um, right, where there is uh, uh, this, uh, this t uh, variable denotes the direction uh, with respect to the boundary in the x and the, in the other directions. Um, so assuming this, uh, this matrix A uh, is uh, T-independent, um, has uh, an infinity coefficients, and is uniformly uh, elliptic. Um, yeah. So, in order to consider this uh, problem with trace in L2, we kind of need to fabricate a space uh, that, uh, yeah, we can hope to find solutions for this. So, uh, that is this uh, space Y12. Um, Right, it is chosen um, yeah, as a yeah, kind of a critical a backspace so that the form associated uh, maps from this space into yeah, its dual space. And it's also in such a way that uh, yeah, if we want to have traces uh, that now live in L2, we also need to be able to go from this space Y1 to, uh, to yeah, some type of uh, traces in L2. And um, that's why we look at this space. 
So what are solutions? Uh, well, we start, of course, with uh, weak solutions, and those are uh, solutions uh, in a weak sense. Uh, so we, we test with some, some function, and then this uh, integral value is zero, then uh, that is a weak, uh, yeah, weak solution, LU is zero. Um, right, so we want to solve uh, Dirichlet, Neumann, and regularity problems. Um, yeah, with, uh, with L2 bounds. So we want uh, to be a solution of, uh, yeah, of our problem. We want that at the boundary, uh, this uh, function as t uh, goes to zero, this thing converges weakly in, in that space. Uh, and we want to have uh, t bounds. So these are these square function bounds. And luckily, we are now really good at uh, treating these uh, types of bonds, so <laughs> it's not surprised. Uh, this is the application. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is uh, really hard work to get these uh, to get uh, bonds like this. Um, so, uh, what is the general strategy for this? Um, so, yeah, these are uh, typical uh, for these types of um, of problems. Um, follows three steps. Uh, we show square function bounds for a linear operator. Um, and in particular, the linear operator that uh, is able to produce weak solutions uh, for our elliptic problem. Um, and then, um, yeah, we want to show boundedness and invertibility of the appropriate boundary and trace operator. So this existence results. And then uh, lastly, we want to show uh, that uh, yeah, any solution with square function bounds is, is the solution produced by the linear operator. Um, yeah, so which operators produce uh, right solutions? Well, as the, uh, yeah, the title suggests, these are these uh, uh, layer potentials. Um, right, so what is a layer potential? I believe it has some history uh, in electro statics, uh, right? I see uh, not of approval. Um, yeah, and if you are working in uh, with easy operators and uh, yeah, uh, then it's very easy to write this down. If you work in these more general spaces, then it looks horrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like this, it looks, uh, looks quite nice. So uh, E is the fundamental solution of, um, uh, yeah, associated to our to our operator, and the single layer potential is, is simply this object. Okay. Um, right, and uh, formally this produces uh, solutions. Uh, so if we apply our uh, operator again uh, to, to this uh, object we have defined, uh, then, then we see that, uh, yeah, that this thing formally uh, is a solution. Um, right. Um, yeah, this, uh, yeah, you, you can define a, a, a more general uh, a single layer potential and then uh, it can be seen that uh, from H minus half data, this maps to this uh, space Y12. Uh, so this is, this is the thing to think about when you want to solve, um, want to solve uh, Dirichlet, the Dirichlet problem. And then for the other, for the other problem, for the normal problem, you can uh, define other types of operators. Um, right, so where do, does the TB theorem uh, come in? Well, we want to show um, a bounds like this. Uh, in particular, we, we, it turns out that we first need to show a bound like this uh, for a high integer m, and then later we can reduce with some type of argument back to uh, yeah, lower uh, m. Um, right, and of course there have been many people who worked throughout the years on these uh, problems. Uh, so there is a, a famous paper from 2011, I believe, uh, by the authors uh, Alfonseca, Auscher, Axelsen, Hoffman, and Kim. Um, and then uh, they uh, looked at uh, yeah, close to real coefficients uh, with no low, lower order terms, so just a divergence-free operator. And then people have tried to, to generalize a bit more, I suppose. Um, and yeah, the state of the arts, so this is the advertisement for the paper of uh, Simon, I guess, 
Uh, <laughs> that treats general coefficients uh, complex with low order terms. And it's due to uh, Bortz, Hoffman, Garcia, <laughs> Maipolo, <Maplo>, and Pochi. <clears throat> Um, right, and yeah, there have also uh, been people working from the semi-group community, um, yeah, uh, authors such as Arthur, Axelson, Hoffman, McIntosh, Morris, and Turner. <coughs> uh, and I believe then that this uh, has concluded our talk. So, thank you very much uh, about this talk on the T1 and TB theorems. I hope you all saw the similarity to the, pro to the proof of the Carter conjecture, right? Uh, so, are there some questions? Yeah. No, 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 you have to speak in the microphone. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I can change RD with some weighted uh, space. Which one? Uh, which? The setting, Rn or Rd, I don't know, Rd or In plus one, whatever. I wonder if I can have similar result for weighted space. Uh. By weight, I mean some L1 function which has an appropriate decay property at infinity. Wait, the, you're talking about the square function estimate, uh, but only... I'm talking about the integral. I mean, if I replace Rn, your setting, with some weighted Rn. Like on the slices? Sure, yeah. And There's I, that's actually the second paper in this nasty and business does, that uh -huh. we do. And does that depend on the kind of weight? For example, is it well, we need, okay, yeah, yeah. polynomial? We need, like, you can do it with nice AP weights. It's like the reasonable thing, right? So, in fact, in the second paper, we get non-tangential maximal function estimates. Okay. Yeah, these guys didn't get to this paper. That's why I'm asking or answering your question. Um, in order to do that, right, you need to get bounds on both the conical and vertical square functions, right? Mm -hmm. And the non-tangential maximal function, L2 estimates you get are sort of weak type, right? And so in order to get strong type, we need LP bounds on the conical and vertical square functions, mm -hmm. yep. And the way we do that is there's this silly saying in weighted norm inequalities, there is no LP, there is only weighted L2, right? But you can get close, if you have weighted L2 bounds, for nice weights, then you get LP bounds for P close to two. So if you have weighted L2 for the nice weights. Yeah, so that's what we use. So for sure, we get those weighted bounds if that's what you're after. If I replace the um, RD with some Riemannian manifold. Boy, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, there's folks that have done this, I guess. Didn't, Andrew, you think you worked on manifolds with, this, with some of this kind of stuff? Sure, I mean, like, you can get certain kinds of single layer potential bounds for like nice operators on, on really rough sets, right? Like L2 bounds on non-tangential maximal functions for like the harmonic layer potential um, in like UR domains. So the boundary is uniformly rectifiable. Okay, that's a, maybe a bit above, <laughs> above, yeah, the project. This is sort of outside, but yeah, sure. I mean, you can do it on really rough sets depending on the operator. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there more questions or comments over there? Yeah, thanks for your talk. So in the beginning, uh, when you want to give some motivation for the T1 theory, you said that there's this connection, connection between the Cauchy integral and the one-dimensional CAR2 result. Could you maybe elaborate a bit on this connection? So we didn't look yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, not so much, uh, but yeah, I mean, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> no, I sort of think this thing is somewhat of like a, like a, it's it's buried in, in one of these early papers, right? Maybe Koshman, Macintosh, Mayer, right? Maybe Andrew's project, you're going to see about this. Ah, uh, yes, then, yeah, I guess. There are these un, unpublished lecture notes of Allen's. And then maybe you see, maybe this is also in this Axel and Keith Macintosh paper as well, or no? Uh, I think it's equivalent between the thermals and the coefficients and the uh, one-dimensional and the manifold. I think there's several similarities to that. But I think the original literature seems to work from that. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
It's it's in French. Hard paper. <laughs> okay, are there some more questions? I don't see any more, so let's thank uh, Project Violet again.